So hi everyone, I'm Danny Fallon. I chair the Department of Mental Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. It's a, a wonderful opportunity. We're the only school of public health in the world that has a department dedicated to mental health. Although I clearly have colleagues and academics across the world who are interested in working hard on mental health. Uh, and so I bring to today's conversation an interest of our department in applying public health um, perspectives to workplace mental health as a public health tool, as well as a tool for businesses and organizations. The context that we're all in is that of the pandemic. And so I will start and end by reminding us of the psychological distress that we all um, on this call are experiencing, as well as all of our colleagues, peers, children, um, parents, etc. And um, that psychological distress, and I'll show you a couple of data points about that, has to do with uh, things associated with the virus itself, you know, so fear of infection, grief or loss, um, uh, worry about um, your own health, uh, but also with the different really critical public health measures that we've all had to take um, that have resulted in social isolation, um, that have resulted in loss of income. We're all experiencing uncertainty across the board. And I would say that other things that have come as a consequence of the pandemic include heightened discrimination, heightened violence, uh, and many others. And so this list is, you know, quite long. So it's reasonable to expect that there has been this kind of distress in our entire population. But I think it's important to remind us all of the context of mental health generally. So prior to the pandemic, mental health was already a critical issue, right? Um, quotes of one in four or one in five, depending on the, the study and the statistics you use, um, note the common experience amongst adults of mental illness uh, every year. And if we aren't talking about a diagnosed illness, but simply feelings of worry or anxiety um, or uh, nervousness, that's one in three adults. And our department really focuses on mental health and behavioral health or substance use challenges. And we know that this is also in a context of increased overdose deaths, at least in the US, but also in many places in the world. And that's important because we know that mental illness is a chronic condition that affects all kinds of things throughout our life course. Uh, and so there, for those who are really severely mentally ill, this can be a 10 to 25 year loss of life. Um, but importantly, most mental health challenges don't come in isolation. So there are many psychiatric conditions or substance use problems that co-occur together. Um, I would also say importantly, um, mental health is not separate from physical health. And I'll show you a slide a little bit more about that. There's other functional disabilities. And again, some of the main concerns uh, experienced by folks that are um, have, having or suffering from a mental health challenge are discrimination, social isolation, reduced opportunity in education and employment. And so today we're talking about employment and stigma. And I think it's worth noting because it will come up again in terms of workplace mental health, how important this synergy between physical and mental health has become. Um, this slide just shows some research data about the increased risk for physical health conditions amongst people who have diabetes, or sorry, amongst people who have depression. So if we look at folks who have depression, they are over two times at risk for diabetes, almost three times at risk for stroke, women with depression over three times at risk for breast cancer, and all of us with depression over five and a half times at risk for heart attack. And you can also imagine, you know, more simple scenarios where if I'm being treated for a cancer diagnosis, but I have become depressed, I am less motivated or able to comply with the recommendations of my physician. And that will then create a spiral that is not good, both in my physical and mental health. So these are entirely intertwined. So it shouldn't be surprising then that mental and behavioral disorders are topping the list of costs. In the US, there is a study that estimated $200 billion per year. And that is actually exceeding some of those physical health conditions that we think are so costly. What's important is a lot of folks who aren't familiar with mental health often think, oh, but that's just how it is. You know, if someone who's depressed is just going to be depressed, and if they can't pull themselves out, so be it. Um, and in fact, it couldn't be further from the truth. These things are preventable and treatable. And so I give just an example of suicide as a condition that we know how to prevent. Um, and that literature in the academic world has really been about things like restricting means. So that figure on the right is, if we know the means by which folks are committing or um, completing suicide, um, then we could address 
policy and individual level education um, that would remove those opportunities. And that has been shown to then remove um, some of the risk of suicide. And so we can do this for many different kinds of outcomes, but I highlighted that one as just a proof of principle that these are preventable um, occurrences. The other thing I wanted to state really quickly though is, unfortunately, although we have the toolbox, if you will, for prevention and for treatment, many, many folks, in fact, most folks who need that treatment don't receive it. In the US, about 40% receive the care that they need. And I've shown you a figure that just shows what that looks like across different kinds of outcomes from alcohol dependence to depression, et cetera. And unfortunately in low resourced countries, this is much worse. A big part of all of this story is the stigma associated with mental and behavioral health. Um, and right now in the context of the pandemic, there's a kind of intersectional stigma between things that are related to uh, infection and things that are related to mental health response. So I thought that context was important to just remind us all of that mental health is already a major public health problem prior to the pandemic. Uh, it has these lifelong um, challenges associated with it. Uh, absolutely treatable and often preventable. Um, but yet we aren't really meeting those needs. And much of it has to do with access to care, but also because of deep and enduring stigma. So why workplace focus? So this figure here just shows uh, in the global setting, we have categories of mental disorders, neurologic disorders, and substance use problems. And this just shows in the life course from age zero up to the you know, 80s and beyond, what the kind of density of occurrence of these kinds of conditions are. And it shouldn't surprise any of us that the major bulk of these experiences with mental health and substance use disorders are in the ages starting around you know, adolescence and going through to about age 60. Well, not surprisingly, those are the years we're employed, right? So if we really want to address this problem, partnering with employers is a way to reach, um, you know, most members of our society. And so we, you know, in academics and in workplace and in many other sectors, I think that a really good solution would be to partner and is to partner with employers and help them to empower employees to do things like decrease the prevalence of these of these conditions, but also to do some specific things. Decrease something called absenteeism as well as something called presenteeism. Um, increase wellness. Decrease costs because the business case is important. Uh, increase awareness and use of these prevention and treatment services and decrease stigma and consequences of disclosing mental health challenges, which is a big barrier in the workplace. So this presentee absenteeism thing is, I knew the word absenteeism, I think we all do. Um, I wasn't as familiar with the concept of presenteeism, um, but this is something we've all experienced. And in fact, in the context of COVID, many of us are experiencing it even more than normal, not always as a consequence of mental health challenges, but as a consequence of the onslaught of updated information that we're all eager to see. Um, but this is this idea that you are present at work, so you're not an absent um, worker, but you're not being productive at your full potential. And that, that really can cost your business um, um, a lot of productivity. And we don't measure this well, partly because we don't have the, the data monitoring structures in place, but also because of stigma, there is underreporting, or sometimes it's sort of unclear how you would capture that data. So I'll give you a couple of slides to just make the point about the business case, though. I think there's certainly a public health case to be made here, but there is also an employer case to be made. The cost burden of mental illnesses to employers is very real. Um, so this will quote, you know, a, another um, billions level um, cost. This is specific to mental health disorders in business setting. Um, these, as I mentioned, often comorbid with physical health conditions. Um, and the interesting and important thing is we can project billions of dollars in savings if we actually address this, if we could integrate mental and behavioral services into the other kinds of services that we think about with employer-employee relations. And this is back to that point of if we could do this well, we could improve productivity because right now mental health and, and, and stress for employees has reduced job performance has resulted in reduced engagement in general, um, disrupted communication problems, um, much impairment of day-to-day -day functioning, and higher rates of disability, which will, could lead to unemployment. 
And I'm just gonna give you one or two comments about major depression as an example, because this is a quite common condition. Um, and we can see from data that are available, 11% decrease in productivity due to depression amongst workers. And if you look at some of the data about absenteeism and presenteeism, that's what's on the left, six to 25 more days per year lost, not in attendance at work. Um, and 13 to 29% of the time reduced um, productivity even when at work. And yet, if we look on the right, we could provide appropriate care. Right, we could reduce this absenteeism presenteeism problem by quite a lot if we were able to provide the treatment and prevention strategies um, that are available. And as I mentioned, this is now specific to the workplace. This this interplay between physical and mental health is very critical to worker health and also to the business case uh, for employers. And so this is just going through some of the things that I already showed you about depression related to obesity and diabetes. Um, it is related to disability uh, and certainly to higher costs. And so we and many, uh, I would say, we have reported the work of many others who have shown that you could make a single dollar investment in mental health promotion that would lead to a three to five dollar return in savings um, in the context of uh, these workplace absenteeism, presenteeism and other health care costs. So uh, Rich Mattingly was mentioned at the beginning of this. Um, we have partnered with the Love You Project that he directs uh, and that um, is in the honor of his late wife, Carolyn Mattingly. And so that Mattingly Award is one of the things that the Love You Project does um, to promote and to um, recognize the very hard and good work of journalists focusing on mental health in our society. Uh, we have partnered with them to create a center for mental health in the workplace that is an academic based center, but recognizes the multi sector needs if we really want to address workplace mental health in in a um, impactful way. And so those of you, if you want, we have a kind of platform paper that was a call to action with some ideas at the individual, organizational and even po policy levels um, for how we think we could step forward to do this. But I want to get back to the pandemic to end. And that is all of that was context prior to the experiences we're all having right now. And what we know right now is that things are getting worse. This is CDC data that came out a couple of months ago. Uh, well, the data is from a couple of months ago um, that shows across kind of every uh, psychological distress measure we could do uh, that we're seeing increases. So this one is just showing that if you just ask about um, any struggle with a mental health or substance use problem right now, 40% of U.S. adults reported um, having this experience right now in the context of the pandemic. If we look at particular situations, so anxiety and depression symptoms, up to 31%, trauma and stress, almost 30%. And then this next one, started or increased substance use. This is not about maintained substance use. This is about increased and then gravely serious consideration of suicide up to 11 percent and this is very wonky and i'm not going to spend a lot of time on it i just want to show you the um the bullets at the bottom they also did some nice analyses showing you know particular situations of high risk and i thought importantly to this conversation those who are employed versus unemployed in fact are showing uh higher frequencies of these kinds of psychological distress and it shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us that essential workers also at increased risk for these kinds of distress. And then the last ones are those who already had a diagnosed mental health condition we knew were vulnerable and indeed are showing very high levels. So we at the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins have been doing a lot of work um, deploying questions on national and international panels and uh, culminating those data and writing papers and those kinds of things. Uh, and so I just wanted to highlight there is a website that really goes through all the different research we've been doing. There's a, a way to link to it there, as well as a way to provide mental health resources. So what are the virtual resources right now in local and, um, and U.S. and even in world settings? So I'll stop and just say that I hope what you took from that very quick overview was mental health challenges are common and costly. 
Um, but I hope you can see there is a business and public health case for why a focus on workplace or employer mental health can make a huge and impactful difference. Uh, COVID has made mental health worse, and we have lots of growing evidence about that. I didn't have time to tell you all the different kinds of nuanced um, insights we've gotten from work about that right now. Uh, employers, with that in mind, employers are now more critical than ever to addressing mental health. Uh, we have a new center dedicated to this, uh, and we and others have already um, stated recommendations for action. Uh, and I hope to see these things put into place as we move forward. It's, it's certainly critical. And um, hopefully the pandemic will uh, get under control in the next several months. Uh, but the mental health consequences of this may take longer to address and solve. And so I think this is a critical aspect of the pandemic that we should all be focused on. And lastly, thank you to those listening. Journalism is critical. One of the main things um, that we have learned in mental health and disaster response is that uncertainty is a major driver of anxiety uh, and other psychological distress. So the more that there is clear and accurate and frequent information, the more you're contributing to a reduction in that uncertainty. So thank you.